raise your hand if you know a young woman aged 15 to 24. Okay, now raise your hand if you know a young man aged 15 to 24. We all know someone in one of the two groups most affected by eating disorders. Hi, my name is Ella, and I'm a young woman aged 15 to 24, and I have an eating disorder. I have anorexia nervosa. I found out when I was 15, and I've been actively addressing it ever since. But why should you guys care? As far as we all know, eating disorders are just something that young, skinny girls give to themselves in order to stay skinny, right? Well, maybe not. There's more in this picture, and it's not just young, skinny girls. It's about older women, too, and men, young and old. And it's not just about the desire to stay thin. There's more to the story, and in order to properly tell it, I'll do it in three parts over the next 10 or so minutes. The first part is my story. Five years of having anorexia and how I learned that I had it and what I've been doing ever since. The second part is about eating disorders in our society and how they tend to get erased or overlooked using generalizations that are more harmful than true. The third part is what we can do to fix this, the importance of education and a changed mindset, and how all of us can work towards fixing something that affects over 30 million Americans alone every year. My freshman year of high school, I joined the cross-country team. I was the only girl. I ran wearing a boy's uniform. And the first time I ever won a race, the lady at the finish line turned to me, and she told me I had won, and I asked her, are you sure? <laughs> by the end of my freshman year, though, I went on to do it sophomore year. And by the end of my sophomore year, we had more of a team, and I was more confident in my abilities. This was incredible. And as the season continued, I knew I wanted to get even better. So I turned to my eating as a way to do that. At first, this was really good for me. But as my season went on, I started dropping weight. I started dividing foods into good and bad categories, and I would only eat things in the good categories. I started counting calories, and I started cutting certain foods out of my diet because I thought they were too bad for me to eat. Mealtime stressed me out because I thought that people would be watching me eat, and I was nervous that they would be. I became a vegetarian, but not for any ethical reasons. I did it to cut more foods out of my diet and restrict myself even more. By the end of my sophomore year of high school, I was 5'11 and weighed 105 pounds. I looked sick, and I was. So jump ahead a year, and I'm sitting in junior year health class. Now, this is the big sex ed year, but we did other things in that class, too. And I remember sitting in class, watching a documentary on these girls at an eating disorder recovery clinic somewhere in Florida. And I was watching this documentary, and I realized that a lot of attitudes and beliefs that these girls had towards food were attitudes that I had and beliefs that I shared. And so I went home that day, and I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I think I have an eating disorder. And she looked at me and she said, Ella, I think you do too. It was little things leading up to that. It was my friends pulling me aside and saying, hey, you look really skinny. And when I said, thanks, they said, no, not a good skinny. Like, a what's wrong with you skinny? It was almost passing out after cross-country practices because I hadn't eaten enough during the day before. It was not getting my period until I was 16 years old and only getting it once that year because there wasn't enough in my body to support it. It was going to bed always feeling hungry and looking forward to the morning because I would let myself eat again. It was feeling guilty when I did eat because for some reason, I didn't think that I deserved it. So I took a step back and I started reevaluating. A big part of me didn't want to go into recovery. I didn't want to change my habits. I didn't want to gain weight. I didn't want to eat more. But another part of me did. I was sick and tired of always feeling sick and tired and cold and, most of all, hungry. I had to be encouraged almost every day by my mom and my friends and the people who loved me that getting better was a good thing and recovery was something I should actively work towards. I started eating more. I stopped cutting certain foods out of my diet and I stopped being a vegetarian. I went to a therapist and I began to open up and acknowledge that maybe I did have a problem. By the time I got to my freshman year at St. Lawrence, I weighed 115 pounds, 
and I had finally learned that my anorexia was attached to my anxiety. When I was in high school, I did so many different things. I took AP classes, I worked hard to graduate third in my class, I did track, I did cross country, I did mock trial, I did Odyssey of the Mind, musical, plays, and all of these things piled on and left me feeling anxious and stressed and out of control. I didn't know what else to do or how else to feel better, and so I turned to one thing in my life that I definitely had control over, my eating, as a way to feel better. I didn't realize it at the time, but of course this wasn't helping me. It was hurting me and the people around me. It's been five years since I learned that I have an eating disorder. My period still isn't normal. It skips months, sometimes three or four in a row, and when I do get it, it's unpredictable. I still have to go to a therapist. I'm at a higher risk for osteoporosis because my bones didn't get all the hormones that they needed during development. Sometimes when I'm anxious or stressed, I catch myself eating less. But I am in recovery. I actually get my period, and to me that's a good thing, as crazy as that sounds. I have gained weight, and I have opened up and acknowledged to myself that this is an issue that I'll continue to deal with. I'm open and honest about the experiences that I went through because I believe building a support network is so important in the recovery process and because the people around me can know that this happened to me and can let me know if they realize anything is wrong. By being honest with myself and building that support network, I work towards recovery even more every single day. And I'm not limited by my experiences. So now that I've talked about my experience with anorexia, let's talk about eating disorders in our society. Who do you think of when you hear the term eating disorder? I'll tell you who I think of. I think of a young woman in that 15 to 24 age group who is skinny and only eats salad at lunch and dinner because she wants to stay skinny. When we think about eating disorders, we think about a very specific group of people affected. We think it comes from a drive to want to look a certain way and not from anything else. This is harmful because it erases the real people affected by these issues and the real reasons underlying them. So let's start breaking down some of those stereotypes. First of all, what is anorexia? According to the National Eating Disorder Awareness Organization, anorexia nervosa is a psychological illness defined by extremely low body weight relative to stature, extreme or needless weight loss, illogical fear of weight gain, and distorted perception of self or body image. It's a physical manifestation of an anxiety. This anxiety stems from feeling so out of control that you don't know what else to do. And so the one thing in your life that you turn towards for control is eating. So anorexia comes from anxiety. Who's affected by that anxiety? In a word, everyone. Everyone gets anxious, which means, in theory, anyone could develop an eating disorder. And it's this idea of everyone that gets erased when we think about it. We tend to forget about those who aren't young and who aren't female. And this is an issue because every single type of person could be affected with an eating disorder. One in 10 men will develop an eating disorder in their lifetime. And eating disorders don't magically disappear once you're older than 24. Erasing the other people affected by eating disorders is harmful because it denies them the ability to seek treatment and to acknowledge that these are issues they could be affected by. This is harmful because even those who are told they're allowed to have an eating disorder, like young women, are reluctant to admit this in the first place. So what can we do? How can we help people with eating disorders without just saying, well, maybe you should eat more? First of all, education. Every day we learn more about mental health and mental health disorders. And slowly but surely, we're making this a conversation that has a place in our daily lives. Knowing not just what an eating disorder is, but what some of its signs could be, are very important in reaching out and helping people who may be affected with these issues. So make a point of knowing those signs. If you notice someone who's not eating a lot at a mealtime, or who seems uncomfortable and anxious, or who isn't eating at all, these could be signs of an eating disorder. And once you notice these things, don't be afraid to say something. It can be very difficult to reach out to somebody and ask them if they have a problem or if they're OK. But sometimes, this is what they need to hear. It took my friends telling me that I didn't look OK for me to seek the treatment that I needed. Besides knowing what an eating disorder is and what some of its signs are, 
we need to start having conversations about breaking down perpetuation of anorexic culture. In our society, we value thinness as a beauty ideal, and this can contribute to anorexic culture by encouraging those with eating disorders that it's not a bad thing to have one because it helps them adhere to a certain beauty standard. If it makes you skinnier and it makes you feel prettier, how could it be bad for you? We need to embrace the idea that there are a variety of body types, and all of them are natural and beautiful. Pride and confidence in yourself can help to alleviate anxieties, and as such, something that's anxiety-based, like an eating disorder. The last thing that we can do in tackling this issue is breaking down some of the negative stigmas surrounding mental health. When we think of someone with a mental health disorder, we think of them as unhinged or unable to function in normal society. And this isn't true. Many individuals who are affected with mental health disorders can function completely fine in society. And you may not notice anything is wrong unless you take a very serious look at, look at something very specific about them, such as their eating habits. We also need to break down these negative stigmas because they stop people from acknowledging issues that they may have. Even though having a mental health disorder is very difficult to live with, it does not make anyone a bad person, and it is not something you should be ashamed to acknowledge in yourself. Many people fear acknowledging a mental health disorder in themselves because they think that they will be judged or treated differently. And this isn't something that should happen. We shouldn't be afraid to say, I have an eating disorder, or my daughter has an eating disorder, or my friend has an eating disorder. Because by having those conversations and putting those ideas out into the open, we contribute to more conversation, which can lead to better treatment methods and getting people affected the help that they need. So now we're reaching the end of this talk. We've talked about my experiences with anorexia and how I learned that it's attached to my anxiety and how I'm working every day towards recovery. We've talked about eating disorders in our society and how we think of a very select group as being affected and how we need to expand our mindset so that we can help more people get the help that they need. We've also talked about mental health and how breaking down those negative stigmas can contribute to more positive conversations and a healthier community. I thank all of you for being here today and listening to what I have to say. Anorexia nervosa is scary and dangerous and affects over 30 million Americans alone every single year. But I don't believe that it's something that we cannot face. I believe that we can work together, start these conversations, find new treatment methods, and get people affected the help that they need. I believe that we can make a real difference. Thank you. <laughs>